golfers, this post is in response to a question from an online student of mine, Kyle Mondlack, who got keen to start practicing and playing again after college upon learning of Bryson DeChambeau's scientific approach to the game of golf. Having been an excellent junior and high school golfer and now working on his game while applying to medical school, Kyle was especially interested in knowing whether there is any credibility to Bryson's idea of placing certain joints at the ends of their ranges of motion to lock them in place. Let me first explain exactly what end range of motion means in anatomy. Every joint has an end range of motion for every direction it can rotate in. So, for instance, the elbow can only flex and extend. It can flex until the muscles of the forearm come into contact with the muscles of the upper arm and that is its end range in flexion caused by the mattressing or padding of the muscles on each side. Similarly, when extended, it can only go until the hook-like olecranon of the ulna bone of the forearm sits firmly in the groove it is designed to fit in on the humerus bone of the upper arm. That is when there is bone-on-bone -bone contact and thus end range of motion is reached. To understand exactly what Bryson is trying to achieve, watch the YouTube video Bryson DeChambeau takes it to the next level with Chris Como. In it, they explain how or why they use the idea of end range of motion or anatomical governors to create locks. They believe that one should hit end range of motion to create locks for various swing aspects one wishes to control, such as for face control, path control, angle of attack control, dynamic loft control. So the main lock Bryson has been using in recent months has to do with his forearms. In the video titled Tuesday Traces with Mike Shai, who is one of his coaches, Mike Shai explains in minute 29 what exactly Bryson is trying to do to prevent his club from opening or closing by placing his lead upper arm in maximal internal or inward rotation and then supinating or outwardly rotating his forearm at address to lock the club face into a square position at impact with an almost chicken wing-like movement past impact. Now the idea of creating locks is not at all new and I have been researching various means of locking up different parts of the body for over 28 years. The concept is important because even leading sports biomechanists have said that the golf swing is the most complex movement in sports to make. It is essential to simplify the swing by cutting out unnecessary movement. So, is Bryson's lead shoulder internal rotation at address a good idea? Keep in mind that the arms and hands are the first thing to move off the ball in the backswing and the last thing to return to the ball just prior to impact. And the damage to the swing is done much before the arms and hands return to the ball. The locks, therefore, should be proximal ones, that is, in the torso, not the arms, so that it, the torso, does not move an excessive amount in all three dimensions. Why? Because the torso is the first body part to be moved in the downswing and errors caused by its movements prevent the arms from ever returning to the ball correctly. Moreover, the torso is a slow-moving body part and thus undoing excessive motion takes time and effort and the arms may never sync up with the torso motion ever again. And being in a position for the arms and body or torso to be tightly coupled is vital for both dynamic balance and club face control. The reason Bryson came up with the idea of placing his lead shoulder in maximal internal rotation in the first place was, as he explains in the video, to avoid his left side misses. In this video, you can see that he faithfully maintains the stiff relationship of his arms that Mike Shai also mentioned in his video until practically the end of his super wide backswing. The issue begins when, towards the end, he suddenly collapses his trail elbow and both wrists so that at the top of the backswing and during transition, 
His arms are totally disconnected from the body and need to catch up with the body as the body makes its downswing movements. If the downswing is some mishmash of arm and body movements made independently of one another and ends up with the lower and upper bodies not stacked one below the other and there is a lot of trail shoulder protraction close to impact, the trail elbow must straighten from an awkward angle and then the hands cannot be as reliable in their club face control. Not even when he tries to hold back his trail wrist, which is something Bryson realized in his sleep prior to the start of his final round at the US Open. The only successful way to control the club face is to have the shoulders slightly close to or at best square to the target line at impact so that the trail shoulder blade is not protracted at that time. The sign for correct shoulder blade positioning is for the trail shoulder to be behind the trail toe and not above it at impact. That is the only way the trail elbow can straighten correctly in the sagittal plane of its design. From that position, the forearms will roll over after impact and the club face cannot help but be pointing straight down the target line at the moment of truth when the club connects the ball. In the words of the famous British poet Alexander Pope, a little learning is a dangerous thing, folks, and only a deep knowledge of musculoskeletal anatomy can help golfers and golf instructors devise meaningful locks to prevent some of the undesirable movements of the golf swing. 